We've all read those stories in the Bible when God performed signs and wonders for some strategic purpose. Gideon and his fleece, the blind man in the temple, Paul confronting Elymas. Within the Christian body, there's a broad spectrum of beliefs on how much God interacts with modern Christians. Where you personally land on that spectrum is between you and your Bible study. This video doesn't really have time for that debate. For the purposes of this video, we're going to assume that there is at least some prophetic interaction that modern Christians can have with the Lord. So if you're interested and open to learning how that process may play out, please allow me to give you a few common sense pointers. If you want to fancy yourself as any sort of prophet, then you need to know you are signing up for a full-time job of discipline and holiness. The great charismatic preachers of times past would be the first ones to tell you this. They were absolute sticklers for Paul's warning in 1 Corinthians 14 about all things being done decently and in order. They devoted themselves to conducting their services exactly how Paul ordered it. And they would rebuke you in the middle of a service if you stepped out of line. Calling yourself spiritual is not an invitation to act like a moron, and any charismatic worth their salt will tell you that. Pursuing spiritual gifts is a high and sacred endeavor. You must be an exemplary example of modesty. You must have peace and harmony in your home life. And you must reject all of the foolish talk of the world. And you got to be in that spiritual gym, building up your muscle for ministry. For the great saints of charismatic heritage, these things were not negotiable. It was not acceptable for you to be at odds with your spouse, especially if your spouse was a believer. And it wasn't okay for anybody to come into the church with a bunch of childish behavior. So if you want to be a warrior for Christ who puts the devil on the run, then you need a little less of this and a little more of this. Rule number two, you need to know that signs are not a replacement for learning. One of God's biggest complaints with Israel in the Old Testament was that they would rather just have a sign to believe than to do the work of knowing the truth. Jesus empowered his apostles to do miracles that were interwoven into a bigger tapestry of compelling preaching and powerful knowledge of Scripture. Every time Paul went to a new city, what did he do? He went to the synagogue and reasoned by the scriptures. Yes, it's true that Paul did his share of miraculous signs and wonders. But if you only focus on that, you're missing half of all the great stuff Paul did. When Paul was in front of Governor Felix, for example, he let loose on a sermon where he reasoned of righteousness and temperance. And that sermon was so powerful that Felix got wrecked. Confirmatory signs are the icing on a well-made cake, not the training wheels on a bike you can't ride. If a false teacher comes to you preaching some clever doctrine, the Bible doesn't say you can use confirmatory signs to give you the answer. The Bible clearly says that gullible people loaded down with sins are going to fall for bad ideas, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Paul blames this problem on amateur theologians who take it upon themselves to teach of the law, saying things that they don't understand. There's nothing in the New Testament anywhere that tells you that you can use signs or miracles as a shortcut to teach you theology. Any kind of shortcut in your doctrinal growth is going to backfire. So even if you believe that confirmatory signs are part of the Christian life, even the most charismatic interpretation of the Bible would tell you to use them sparingly and studiously. And finally, we come to rule number three. What sort of thing would be a confirmatory sign? Well, you need to know this principle. Uncanny confirmations are more common than you think. And just because something is uncanny doesn't mean it's supernatural. I have a little exercise I'd like you to try. 
think of something you could use as a MacGuffin. It could be a number, it could be some kind of bumper sticker, it could be the model of a car, it could be anything. Just choose some object that you can go around looking for. And then go about your life every day looking for the MacGuffin. Whatever it is, I'm here to tell you that you're going to see it more often than you think. And if you try hard enough, you can convince yourself that this is some sort of spiritual message. Gideon's miracle was really supernatural. Numbers on the clock come along at least twice a day. So if you're going to get into the business of looking for signs, then you need to make sure you know what actually is a sign. Now to help you with that process, I now offer tip number four. When you begin to work in any spiritual calling, it's best to start out small. Yes, Jesus tells us his sheep know his voice. But just because a sheep recognizes the familiar voice of a shepherd, that's not the same as understanding the shepherd's instructions. Knowing who your shepherd is can keep you alive, but only rigorous training can make you a team player. In Jeremiah chapter 1, a young Jeremiah begins his prophetic ministry with a series of simple visions. And the Lord keeps asking him, what do you see? When Jeremiah reports what he saw, the Lord says, good. And in the New Testament, Paul tells young prophets to learn how to conduct themselves in services and to learn from each other as they analyze what's being spoken. If you believe God gave you a spiritual calling, then you need to take this to heart. You cannot go from zero to 60, especially if you're not under the tutelage of an elder who is experienced in your calling. That is a recipe to end up acting like a moron. You need to keep your ambition down to size, and you must immerse yourself in everything the Bible has to say about how to develop a spiritual calling. If you walk before you run and you stick with what you know, then you will have a better chance of success. I hope this video is a blessing to somebody. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments, and maybe I can make some videos to answer some of your questions. So now, let's go ahead and pause. Go take a nap, digest what we've talked about so far, and then get up and hit that gym. Be blessed.